The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. Tell you a story that happened. We just got off the plane. We just got off the plane, my wife and I and the kids. What's today? Tuesday. We got off the plane yesterday. We got off the plane. And so, you know, it's a long flight. It's five and a half hours coming from New York. It's a long flight. I had Rabbi Schreiber sitting right in front of me for all the Eula guys. It was actually really cool that we had that. <laughs> it was perfect. It was a long flight. And, uh, you know, my kids are starting to cry. I'm like, shh, Rabbi Schreiber's in the kidding. <laughs> so, no, they, 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 they were. He, we, we actually had some great schmoozing. He was great with the kids. So, we land and we hired the service. And there's this great service over here that, uh, especially if you have a family, so either you can pay $8 million, you know, to hire some kind of a thing, or you have a guy who comes with your minivan to pick you up from the airport. Now, if anybody, if you want to have to like, give you his number, it's amazing. He, he takes your keys, he takes your car and picks you up, and it's really not so expensive. So we message the guy, and we say to him, that's it, Hineni, we're, we're here, we're getting the bags. Huh? <clears throat> All right, we're starting to get out. We finally get the bags, we're starting to go out. You know, LAX is, is always just jam-packed. And my wife calls the guy, or messages the guy, and she says, where are you? We're outside. And the guy's like, I'm on the way. My wife is like, it's not cool, you're on the way. You know, we have Atlanta with seven people, the kids are crying out there. You know, you spoke, we told you the time. You know? So my wife said, you know, we're kind of waiting outside. The guy's like, you know, I'll, kind of, I'll be there when I'll be there type of thing. Now, I wasn't okay with that. The Moroccan inside me. She should have left earlier. What an idiot. You know, uh, and like a Jew, what was my threat in my own mind that gave me some kind of solace and peace? I said, I'm not going to give him a tip. Yeah. <laughs> right? that's, that's my, anyway, I'm not giving him a tip. Sure enough, the guy eventually went out there for 25 minutes, whatever. The guy pulls up at the van. And yeah, I'll come out a lot of bags, open up the back, and there I am killing myself. And Shine, this guy is standing and he's he's texting on his phone while I'm doing all the bags. Giving him a tip, nothing a tip. He's not even helping me with the bags. Come on, put it all inside it. And we had all, you know, the way we travel. So, you know, finally I stick it all inside, get it in there, throw we close it, we get into the car, start to pull away. And I say to the guy, How you doing? What's your name? Tells me his name. And I can hear it just from what he said, I can hear he's Israeli. So I said to him, I said, Ken, I said, are you okay? Is the family okay? And he waits a second. He said, I'm flying tonight to Israel to be drafted. We assume if I could go further under my seat from embarrassment, I would have. So he said to me, I'm sorry I was texting. He said, but the travel agent just got back to me right then to tell me which fly whatever. And I had to tell them whether I'm going or not. He's like, I'm sorry I didn't help you with the bags. I got all emotional. And I said to him, unit are you in? He just says to me, I'm an engineer. Me being a moron American, I have no idea what that means. Afterwards, I looked that up. An engineer means that before the front line, before the front line soldiers go in, they send in engineers to go and to figure out what's the safest way to find that there are booby traps for all different things. He's on the front of the front line. This tzaddik. Like an idiot. I sat there assuming. Assuming that I know, assuming that when he laughed, I gave him a hug, I cried, I got his name to pray for, I, I gave him a tip. <laughs> I, I, uh, we assume, we assume. Rodev Shalom means we have to stop assuming. We have to stop thinking we know everything about everyone. We know nothing about anybody. All we know is, is that we have to go and make up stories about them in a positive light. That's what brings us together. Guys, we have to begin to love each other. And love each other, mamash, means that we don't hold grudges against anybody. Even if they've hurt us, we have to make up a story of why they did that. We have to accept them from whom they are. We have to get past that. That's what's going to bring the Ananeha Kavod back. That's what brings the protection back. Loving each other completely and absolutely. We have to learn to take all of our preconceived notions about everybody else and throw it away. Because, let's face it, you know when you're happy to see people, unfortunately? When you're on the wrong side of a tragedy, then all of a sudden we're very happy to see everybody. Tragedy? Then we're ready to hug. Tragedy? Then, even if somebody shows up at your house, you're just like, I'm just so happy to see you. When we were standing outside there in the airport just yesterday, some lady, I don't think she was Jewish, she came walking by me and she looked at me. She said, can I ask you something? I said, yeah. She said, did you just come from Israel? 
I, I don't know what gave away that I'm Jewish. I, I have no idea. So I, was, I, was, I, I was wearing my hat. You, got, you, you guys have seen if you come drinking with me, then you know, you know, so that's my travel hat. So I thought I was incognito, right? I, 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 I don't know how she pulled it up. But she's like, did you? I said, no, we just came from, from the East Coast. And, and she just looked at me. She's like, I'm just so sorry. It's like, ah, everything should be good. And she walked away. And then she, 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 you know, tragedy makes strangers talk to each other. I remember after 9-11, I was in Manhattan. I was in New York. I was then six. I had to go for my chemo in Manhattan. And two days after 9-11, I was on the train. New Yorkers don't talk to each other on trains. It's a rule. If you talk to a New Yorker on the train, they think you're insane. That's all. Or they'll beat you up and rightfully you deserve it. Because when you're talking to somebody, we were on the train. Never forget this. So, you know, I was going through chemo. So I didn't have much, as opposed to now, where my long flowy locks are just, but had on a cap, had on a Superman cap. And some Italian guy was like, hey, we could have used him the other day, huh? I don't know. I don't know what he was talking about. I'm like, I'm sorry. He's like, yeah, your cap, you got Superman. We could have used him the other day, huh? And I'm translating this. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we know we could have used him. It's like, so where were you? And I was at home. I'm like, where were you? It's like, yeah, I was, uh, you have any, we just started to talk. And then everybody else on the train just started to talk and everybody's just schmoozing. And, and I wasn't judging him. From his man, he wasn't judging me because tragedy melts barriers and it allows for the best of us, the best of our humanity to come out. And Hashem is saying, do you need to melt those barriers around each other and connect and connect? You know, it happened on the day of Simchat Torah. We were all connecting. And Baruch Hashem, it happened that for us to recognize this is what we need. This is the fuel. This is what we have to have. Connect. So step one of what it is that we have to do is dropped all the preconceived notions and we need to connect. And boy, are we amazing at that. Mi ka'amcha Yisrael go'achad ba'aretz. I mean, if you do have to look at news, you make sure you look at the news, what's going on on Jewish websites. We've sent tons, tons, and that's not an exaggeration, of equipment, of supplies, of food. And when you see what's going on in Israel itself, I have, I have a sister-in-law who lives in Beit Shemesh. And she, she, she's a cook for different things. She blamed how has, they have a lot of kids. They're all at home now. They're not in school. And she put up a picture of what she, she's like, this is what I'm sending out to the troops. A mountain of just trays and trays. And they don't have any money. But trays of schnitzel and trays of food and trays. And if you guys saw that video of that one soldier who was saying, he's like, wherever we go, he's like, we're putting on weight. <laughs> wherever we go, there's more falafel, more shawarma, more, you know, everything. You know, the Haredi, I... These Ger Hasidim are setting up falafel stands in Gaza. You know, so like, yeah, yeah, that's what, it's true. But like, they, they, they're, they're going, they're giving me. Guys, Rabbi Berkowitz would always say, when the Jew has his back up against the wall, we are at our best. We are at our best. When we're challenged, when there's tragedy, there's nobody like us. And the greatest of us comes out. And that greatness that comes out, it's something that we have to look in the mirror and say, this could be, and this has to be me, always. So step one is doing great things for other people and loving them. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire.org.